The London Dairy and Luxbilly Railway had its origins in a broad gauge line which opened in 1863 between the city of Derry and a pier on Luxbilly at Farland Point. The line was extended to Bunkrana in 1864. An act of 1863 authorised the letter Kenny Railway to run over the Swilly's tracks from that town into London Derry, though some 20 years elapsed before it was built. Opened in 1883, the Letterkenny line was built to the gauge of three foot and worked by the Swilly Company, which shortly afterwards converted its own line to the narrow gauge. Government money made available under the Railways Ireland Act of 1896 allowed the Swilly to expand its system. The Bencrana line was extended to Carndenna in 1901, but it is the extension of the Letterkenny line to Burtonport which concerns us here. But with the extensions in mind, larger locos were obtained. Number 9, originally named Aberfoyle, was one of a pair of 462 tanks built by Kerr Stewart in 1904. The Swilly's big engine policy culminated in the engine we will see on the film, and in numbers 5 and 6, the only 484 tanks ever to run in these islands. These were built by Hudswell Clark in 1912. Our film for Lux Swilly was made by the Reverend Tom Doherty in 1939. We present this unique document in the form in which he made it. It features the highlights of a run from Letterkenny to Burtonport behind one of the Swilly's remarkable 480 tender engines, the only locomotives of this wheel arrangement ever to run in these islands. The Letterkenny and Burtonport Extension Railway was opened in 1903. It ran from Letterkenny for nearly 50 miles through some of the bleakest and poorest parts of Ireland to the tiny fishing village of Burtonport. It could never have been built without the £300,000 of government money sunk into it in an attempt to open up this remote and impoverished district. The Londonderry and Burtonport Extension was a separate company, though worked by the Swilly, and locos and rolling stock bought with public money to work the line, carried the initials L and BER to distinguish them from the rest of the Swilly stock. The journey from Derry to Burtonport took over five hours. It was the great epic of the Irish Narragage. The first part of our journey was filmed in black and white. But suddenly we are experiencing what we believe to be the first ever colour film made of an Irish railway. The Burtonport line closed in June 1940. The wartime shortages of oil for the replacement road vehicles led to the reopening of the section from Letterkenny to Guidor in 1941. This section finally closed for good in January 1947. The Bedford lorry and the adjacent road, which will follow the train for most of the journey, is a sign that even in this most remote corner of Donegal, the Norgage Railway had to face increasing competition from road transport. In this barren, rocky landscape, the line climbed to pass through the mountains at a spot known as Barnes Gap. Having crossed over the road, we get a first glimpse of the Owen Carroll Viaduct, 380 yards long, the most impressive feat of civil engineering on the whole of the Irish Norgage. 
On the night of January the 30th, 1925, gales howling in from the Atlantic and funnelled by the valley down to the viaduct blew two carriages of a passenger train onto the rocky embankment which formed part of the structure, resulting in the deaths of four passengers. The strange, flat-topped, muckish mountain looms over the bleak landscape. Our friend in the Bedford lorry puts in another appearance. At Krishla, some of the locals pose for the camera as the engine takes water. Trains on the extension were mixed and shunting at intermediate stations could play havoc with the timetable. It is interesting to see County Donegal railway wagons on a swilly train as the two lines had different buffer heights and brake fittings and their wagon stocks were mostly incompatible. Many of the stations in the Burtonport line, like Dunfanaghy Road, were miles from the villages they were supposed to serve. At the stop for water at Crawley, we get some further glimpses of the 480 number 12. One of a pair built in 1905 by Hudswell Clark, sister loco number 11 had been withdrawn in 1933, worn out by years of hard work on the Burton Boat Line. These engines weighed nearly 59 tonnes and had flangeless leading drivers to help them get round sharp curves. Their tenders could carry 1,500 gallons of water and four tonnes of coal. Castle and Dunglo were the last two stations on the line before Burtonport, and both were miles from the villages in their titles. And so we arrive at Burtonport. Number 12 lasted until the end of Loch Swilly Rail Services in 1953. It had little work to do following the closure of this line in 1947. It is a great shame that this magnificent machine was cut up. If it had lingered for a few more years, it would surely have been a worthy candidate for preservation. The County Donegal Railway operated Ireland's largest narrow gauge network, which had at its peak a route mileage of 124. Like the London Dairy in Luxwilly, it had its origins in a broad gauge branch. This ran from Straban to Stranorer and was converted to the three foot gauge in 1892. The independent Donegal Railway was taken over in 1906 by the English Midland Railway and the Great Northern Railway of Ireland. The Midlands interest passed to the LMS at the grouping of Britain's railways in the early 1920s. The Donegal served Letterkenny, Straban, Derry, Stranorler, Glenties, Donegal Town, Killybegs and Ballyshannon. Three classes of steam locomotives survived into the 1950s. The Class 4 Baltic or 464 tanks dated from 1904. The Class 5 264 tanks were built in 1907 and 1908. 
An improved version of this class consisting of three engines was introduced in 1912. These three Class 5A locomotives were the last new steam locomotives delivered to the CDR. The Donegal was a pioneer of the use of diesel rail cars on passenger services. We shall see a variety of these distinctive vehicles on our programme ranging from number 10, dating from 1932, seen here, to later developments on the basic design which had a power bogey and an engine unit articulated from the passenger saloon. We begin our films at Ballyshannon on the southern tip of County Donegal on the 30th of May 1957 where Tim Shuttleworth recorded real car number 15, shunting prior to forming a service to Donegal Town. Number 15 was built in 1936 and could seat 41 passengers. When Keith Christie visited Ballyshannon in September 1957, wheel car number 18 was on duty. Built in 1940 with seats for 43 passengers and powered like the other Donegal rail car seen in this programme by a Gardner diesel engine, number 18 has recently been restored to full working order and can be seen at the Foyle Valley Railway Museum, built on the site of the old G&R terminus at Foyle Road in Derry. The rail car sound effects in this programme represent the authentic voice of number 18, recently recorded at the museum through the courtesy of the Amenities Department of Derry City Council. Rail car number 10, seen here at Killy Beggs, was the first of the diesel articulated rail cars to run in Ireland. Supplied to the Clogher Valley Railway in 1932 by Walkers of Wigan, and bought by the CDR in the closure of that line in 1941, this historic vehicle has also been preserved and is to be found in the splendid new railway gallery the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum at Coltraw in County Down. Number 10 was the smallest of the CDR rail cars, seating 28 passengers. When Tim Shuttleworth visited Killy Beggs in May 1957, wheel car number 16 was on duty and had just been turned. The CDR had a policy of waste not, want not. The turntable at Killy Beggs was constructed from the frames of the Class 5 264 tank, number 19, Letter Kenny, which was withdrawn in 1940. The CDR rail cars were powerful enough to haul a coach and a few vans when the need arose. This extended their limited capacity and made for greater operating flexibility. The vans painted in red livery were lighter than normal goods wagons and were designed to be used in conjunction with the rail cars. The next part of our programme was filmed by Keith Christie on his visits to Ireland in 1957 and 1958. Inver was roughly halfway between Killy Beggs and Donegal Town. Rail car number 16 approaches the station on a service from Donegal, hauling a van and one of the trailers designed for use with the rail cars. Inver did not possess a passing loop, but trains could be crossed by running the eastbound service into the goods siding and then reversing it up to the platform when the westbound train had arrived. Wheel car number 19 arrives from Killy Beggs. This vehicle built in 1950 and her sister number 20 which came the following year were the ultimate developments of the Walker rail cars for the CDR. As we will see later in the programme, rail cars similar to these were ordered by CIE for the West Clare Railway. Numbers 19 and 20 still happily survive having been bought by the Isle of Man Railway on the closure of the Donegal system in 1959.
trains back to back at Inver prepare to leave for Killybegs and Donegal Town, the latter being our next destination. Lines from Ballyshannon, Killybegs and Stranorla converged on Donegal Town. A railcar not on service approaches from the Stranorla direction. The main operating drawback of the Walker railcars was that they could only be driven from one end and thus had to be turned at each terminus. They could not be operated in multiple. If two rail cars were used together, each had to have a driver. There were no sophisticated refuelling facilities on the County Donegal. Drivers invariably carried a few cans of diesel around in the cabs of their rail cars. Railcar number 10 arrives at Donegal Town from Stranorla, forming a through service to Killybegs. On August the 11th, 1958, passengers board railcar number 14, built in 1935, at a cost of £2,229. Number 14 had seats for 41 passengers. The green wicker post office cart was once a common sight in the Irish Republic. We head north from Donegal Town to Stranorla, enjoying the spectacular scenery of Barnsmore Gap from the bumpy perspective of rail car number 10. A rail car, a coach and a red van arrive at Stranorla from Donegal Town. The abutments of the bridge which carried the Glenties branch which closed completely in 1952 over the River Finn can be seen in the foreground. Two rail cars with number 20 in the lead arrive at Stranorla with a train from Straban on August the 9th 1958. We catch our first sight of Donegal steam at Stranorla. Number 11 Iron, the last survivor of a class of four 464s built by Naismith Wilson in 1904, leaves Stranorla with the goods for Straban. Crossing as it did the international border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, Donegal trains were subject to an examination by customs and excise officials. Here at Castle Finn, Passengers who have detrained from a railcar from Straban and their luggage are examined by Irish customs men before continuing their journey to Stranorla and beyond. Number 11 Ern waits in the siding for the customs formalities concerning its goods train to be completed. Passengers' luggage is reloaded into the van behind rail car 15. And after the tiresome and tedious delay, which was an everyday fact of life on the CDR, the onward journey is resumed. Later in the day, one of the 264 tanks shunts goods wagons for the benefit of the customs men at Castle Finn. We move on to Straban, where the CDR met the broad gauge Great Northern Line from Derry to Belfast and Dublin. Here we encounter the Donegal's only diesel locomotive, number 11 Phoenix, built in 1933 as a steam tractor by Atkinson Walker of Preston for the Clogher Valley Railway. As built, it was underpowered and virtually useless. On the Donegal, it was equipped with a Gardner diesel engine similar to those used in the rail cars and gave many years of useful service shunting at Straban. 264 tank number 4 Mean Glass arrives with a goods train from Stranorla. 
whilst Phoenix waits to dispose of the wagons which the steam locomotive has brought in. As Class 5A No. 2 Blanche waits for the off with the goods to Little Kenny, on the adjacent GNR broad gauge line, a 06-0 and a 440 head a train of failed rail cars in the direction of Oma. Rail cars 12 and 10 arrive at Straban with the tail of coaches and vans in tow from Stranorler. The third coach is one of a set built by the LMS NCC in Belfast in 1928 for the boat trains between Ballymena and Larne in the long closed three foot gauge system in County Antrim. At last, Blanche gets underway with the Letterkenny goods. The CDR had a sensible attitude to its steam locomotives. Whilst rail cars dominated the normal passenger service, steam locomotives were kept in good order for goods traffic and excursion trains. County Donegal wagons had continuous brakes. The brake coach at the end of the train was not ballasted like a conventional brake van. It was provided to accommodate the guard. The Straban to Letterkenny line was opened as late as the 1st of January 1909. It was the last part of the Donegal's network of lines to be built and was largely funded by the system's joint owners, the Midland and the Great Northern. 264 tank number 6, column kill shunts at Letterkenny. On the 9th of August 1958, Blanche brings the daily goods from Letterkenny to Straban into Raffoe station. Some difficulty is encountered by the railwaymen as they struggle with the Jacob's Biscuits container. Later in the day, number four mean glass arrives at Rafaux hauling a rail car which then continued to Letterkenny under its own power. Meanglass was on a test run following some repairs. The loco coupled up to rail car number 16, which it then hauled back to Straban. As Meanglass moves off to the shed, two of the CDR's remaining trio of Class 5 264 tanks are seen together. The three engines which survived under the closure of the system, numbers 4, 5 and 6, mean glass, drumbo and column kill, have all been preserved. The remainder of our County Donegal footage was shot in the mid-1950s by the late J. H. Roberts. His films begin on the Letter Kenny line at Raffoe. Real cars cross at Lifford, just over the border from Straban, which is our next port of call. The impressive station name board from Straban can still be seen in the new railway gallery at the Cultural Museum. It was almost impossible to visit Straban without seeing Phoenix shuffling around the yard on its shunting duties. The redoubtable Henry Forbes, manager of the CDR in the 1930s, who had Phoenix reconstituted as a diesel, is supposed to have sold her old boiler to a laundry.
264 tank number 5 Drumbo is about to depart from Straban with a goods to Stranora. When J.H. Roberts visited Derry in the mid-1950s, he recorded UTA buses on city services and on the Craigavon Bridge over the River Foyle. But by this time the CDR branch from Straban to Derry had already closed and the tracks to the Norwegian terminus at Victoria Road had been lifted. After a gap of nearly 40 years, CDR stock again runs in Derry at the new museum opposite the site of the old terminus. Back at Straban we glimpse the 264 tank and GNR railcars in their blue and cream livery before heading off up the Finn Valley on the three foot gauge. We stop at Castle Finn for customs examination. And head on to Stranorler in the ubiquitous railcar number 10. Number 10 terminates at the impressive Stranorler station. In the bay is railcar number 12, the first Walker diesel supplied to the CDR, which arrived in 1934. To the end, the CTR maintained a sizable fleet of carriages which were hauled by steam locomotives when special trains or excursions were called for. In a siding is railcar trailer number three, which began life as a dreary petrol engine railcar on the Dublin and Blessington steam tramway before being bought and regaged by the CDR in 1934. Number 12 moves out of the bay as number 10 shuffles a red van around the station. We will travel on number 12 along perhaps the most scenic part of the Donegal system, from Stranorla to Donegal Town, through Barnsmore Gap. We pause at Derg Bridge Halt. Things are stirring in the hills of Donegal. This is the section of the CDR that the South Donegal Railway Restoration Society is planning to rebuild. The spirit of the CDR, which has slumbered since 1959, will soon be revived in this wonderful setting. The rail car pauses at Loch Esk, which will be the terminus of the new line. The original West Donegal Railway terminated here for seven years in the 1880s, until funds could be found to extend the line to Donegal Town. The station buildings at Donegal Town are still in existence, although the tracks and the rail cars and their trailers have long departed. The appearance of the town itself has not greatly changed since the 1950s. Though it is a good deal harder to find a parking place today than it was then. Back at the station, some boys indulge in the illegal gambling game of pitch and toss, oblivious to the arrival of Real Car 18 from Ballyshannon. Work goes on in the goods yard as rail car number 20 arrives from Killy Beggs, which is our final destination on the County Donegal. Passengers alight at Duncanilly, one of the intermediate stations on the branch. As we approach Killy Beggs, we see an Irish Navy fisheries protection vessel moored in the bay. This is one of the three flower class corvettes bought from the Royal Navy after World War II. Fish from Killybegs was an important source of traffic for the railway, but ominously, a lorry is at the quayside. And so we take our leave of the County Donegal and move to a system of a very different character, the Cavan and Leitrim. Built in the 1880s, interest on the capital employed to build the line was guaranteed by the ratepayers in the districts or baronies which the railway served. These baronial guarantees were encouraged by the Government's Tramways Act of 1883, 
a potent stimulus to the spread of the three-foot gauge in Ireland. The Cavan and Leitrim main line ran from Drummond on the Midland Great Western Dublin to Sligo route to Belturbet, the terminus of a branch of the Great Northern Railway, from Ballyhays on its clonus to Cavan line. From Ballinamore, a branch of the Norrigage ran to Arigna. For the opening of the system, eight 440 tanks were supplied by Robert Stevenson and Company. Several of these, including number two, now in the museum at Coltraw, were still active in the 1950s. The Great Southern Railway, which took over the Cavan and Leitrim in 1925, transferred locos from some of its other Norrigage lines as they closed down, including the four 242 tanks, which formed the complete stock of the Cork, Black Rock and Passage line, closed in 1932. From the Tralee and Dingle Railway came 260 tank number three in 1941. Sister engine number six, a Hunslet 260 tank dating from 1898, came to the CNL's headquarters at Balnamore as late as 1957. We begin our travels at Drummond, the southern terminus of the line. These scenes were recorded by Keith Christie on August the 11th, 1958. Number 12, the ex Cork Black Rock and Passage engine, is making up her train. The large driving wheels of these engines were designed to give them a decent turn of speed on the suburban services into Cork for which they were designed. On the face of it, they were unsuited to the Calvin and Leitrim, but they performed gallantly on the line from Drummond to Belturbet, two lasting until the end of the system in 1959. They were not allowed to work on the Ballinamore to Arigna line. The train calls it Doreen, the first station beyond Drummond. The guard sells a late camera ticket. We have two sequences at Mohill. In August 1958, number 12 abandons her train to take water, whilst the passengers wait patiently for the operation to be completed. In February 1959, just a few weeks before the line finally closed, the former Trolley and Dingle engine, number six, is on duty. Cavan and Leitrim trains were mixed, and shunting often took place at stations along the route. Patience was indeed a necessary virtue for passengers in this line. We head north through the bleak winter landscape, hauled by number six. Ballinamore was the line's headquarters and the junction for the Drumshambo branch, more commonly referred to as the Arigna Tramway. The former Trillian and Dingle number three shunts in the station. The other surviving cork engine number ten and ex Trillian and Dingle number six stand outside the engine shed. The reason the Cavan and Leitrim survived so long was that it served one of Ireland's rare deposits of coal, which was found at Arigna. Even in the late 1950s, traffic from the mines could be very heavy, with extra coal trains often required. The need for the railway evaporated when the Irish government decided to build a power station near the mines to burn Aregna's poor quality coal, and this led to the closure of the system in March 1959. We are now heading out of Balnamore towards the line's northern terminus at Belturbet. The tail of wagons of Aregna coal in the brake van follow the passenger coach. The engine takes water at Ballyconnell.
Waiting for the road at Belturbet with the southbound train of coal empties is another extra lane Dingle engine 260 tank, number four. This train was later recorded steaming across the bridge over the River Erne, not far from the station. At Belturbet the coal had to be shuffled by hand from narrow gauge to broad gauge wagons. The Great Northern Nord 6 Nord will later take the coal on, probably to the cement factory at Drogheda. Back at Ballinamore, Trillian and Dingle No. 3 makes up a train which will run on the branch to Arigna. For much of its length, this branch was a roadside tramway, though the first section out of Balnamore did have its own right of way. We pass a disused lock on the Balnamore and Ballyconnell Canal. 1993 happily saw the reopening of this waterway, which will enable craft to travel from Loch Erne in the north to the Shannon in the south. A wonderful prospect for those interested in inland waterways. This is the roadside tramway proper. The line follows the curves and undulations of the road. The steam-operated roadside tramway was not uncommon in France and Belgium, but rare in the British Isles. Ominously, a lorry speeds past the train. The internal combustion engine was the cause of the downfall of the Irish narrow gauge. The steam locomotive represented the technology of the 19th century, the car, the bus and the lorry, that of the 20th. These scenes were filmed in February 1959, by which time the coal traffic had already finished. Drumshambo was the only village of any size on the tramway. Number three takes water before continuing to Arigna. The previous summer the line had been much busier. The coal trains were still running at this stage. In August 1958, number three was again replenishing her thirst at Drumshambo. With steam leaking from every joint, number three was busy shunting wagons at the station that day. On the final stretch to Aregna on a day of very heavy showers, a permanent way gang resumed their work after the passage of our train. Passenger trains terminated at Aregna. Number three is turned, and later in the day brings a loaded coal train down from the mines, along an extension built as late as 1920. This is the view from the rocking, swaying footplate of number three as we head back towards Balnamore. We negotiate one of the ungated public road crossings on the tramway, where accidents between trains and road vehicles were not unheard of. As the tail of coal wagons bounces along behind the local, 
It is worth noting that these vehicles, like the goods wagons on most of the Irish narrow gauge lines, were fully fitted with vacuum brakes. In this respect, at least, they were superior to most of the freight vehicles in service in the age of steam on the standard gauge railways of both Britain and Ireland. We pull away from Cornabrone on a thoroughly miserable day. The rain desists, at least for a while. We are overtaken by another lorry before we arrive back at Balnamore. At Balnamore, number 12, the former Cork Black Rock and Passage engine, makes up her train, which she will later haul to Drummond. As number three shunts the coal wagons she has just brought down from the mines, we say farewell to the Cavan and Leitrim Railway. One of the most famous narrow gauge railways in Ireland was the Tralee and Dingle Railway. Its main line ran from Tralee for nearly 32 miles down the beautiful but remote Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry. A short branch served Castle Gregory on the shores of Tralee Bay. Services on the line began in March 1891. It was built at the astonishingly low cost of £2,700 per mile. The consequences of this were gradients as steep as 1 in 29 and very severe curves. Revenue barely covered the operating costs, let alone the guaranteed interest on the capital used to build it. Passenger services ended in April 1939, at which date the Castle Gregory branch closed completely. Goods services continued up to 1947, when coal shortages curtailed operations. A rail service was eventually restored in the form of a monthly cattle train run to coincide with the fair at Dingle. These trains attracted much interest from railway enthusiasts in Britain and beyond. The cattle trains ended in June 1953. In that month, a valedictory special train was organised by the Light Railway Transport League and the Irish Railway Record Society. J. H. Roberts was a passenger and recorded what was almost certainly the last passenger train on the line. The locomotive which hauled the special was number 8, a 260 knot tank built by Hunslet in 1910. Following the closure of the Tralee and Dingle, number 8 went to the West Clare Railway, but there it was rendered redundant by the complete dieselisation of that system, and it was scrapped in the mid-1950s. The special gingerly crosses the famous Lispole viaduct. Eastbound trains faced a stiff climb from here to a summit at Gary Nadur, which involved stretches at 1 in 29. The people of Dingle turn out in force to see the last passenger train on their railway. Beyond Dingle station, a short branch ran to the harbour. It had fallen into disuse by the 1930s, but its rails had the distinction of being the most westerly in all of Europe. In 1993, a short section of the line from Tralee to Blennerville reopened as a tourist attraction. The motive power being Tralee and Dingle 262 No. 5, originally preserved in America, but restored and repatriated for use in the Kingdom of Kerry once again. By way of a complete contrast with the grass-grown tracks of the Trillian Dingle, we conclude our programme with a visit to the only Irish three-foot gauge line to be completely dieselised. The line ran from Ennis to Kilkee, with a branch from Wyasta Junction to Kilrush. In the early 1950s, CIE bought four Walker articulated railcars for the line's passenger services. These were similar to the County Donegal railcars numbers 19 and 20, which we saw earlier. Good services were dieselised in 1955 with the arrival of three diesel locomotives from the same firm. If the Irish narrow gauge had a future, this was it. We're travelling on the broad gauge line north from Limerick 
behind one of CIE's C-Class crossley engine diesels. The silver livery in which these locos were supplied soon got into a terrible state and was quickly abandoned. A southbound train, hauled by another C-Class diesel, arrives at Ennis. Where later we have a contrast between broad and narrow gauge rail cars. The West Clare rail car seen here at Ennis Diamond is hauling one of the trailers built at Inchicore Works to increase the passenger capacity of the new rail cars. There were a great many level crossings on the West Clare. The station master at Moyasta Junction alone had no less than five under his control. The track as filmed by Keith Christie from the front of the rail car seems to be in excellent condition. Between Milltown, Malby and Quilty, the line ran close to the coast. At Quilty, an anemometer was installed. In steam days, if wind speeds reached 60 miles per hour, only specially ballasted stock was allowed to run. If wind speeds reached over 80 miles per hour, services were suspended. Trains had been blown off the track in this section in 1897 and again in 1899. Moyasta was the only triangular junction on the Irish Narra gauge. Trains from Ennis usually ran through to Kilkee, with the connection being provided from the junction to Kilrush. A through line was provided to enable trains to run direct from Kilrush to Kilkee. In the diesel era, this connection was used to turn rail cars which had come up from Kilrush. Like the Donegal rail cars, those on the West Clare could only be driven from one end. Passengers leave rail car number 3386 at Moyasta and cross the platform for the connecting service to Kilrush, which is also our destination. At Kilrush, the line ran beyond the passenger station for a mile or so to cap up here on the Shannon Estuary. This was built to enable a connection to be made with the steamers, which sailed on the estuary. This line had fallen into disuse by the 1920s. The loop at Moyasta had originally been built to allow trains connecting with the steamers to run through to Kilkee. At Kilrush, one of the West Clare's trio of diesel locomotives is making up a freight train prior to departure to Ennis. Number F503 was delivered in 1955 from Walkers of Wigan, the firm which also built the rail cars. The power units were similar to those used on the passenger vehicles. The high centre cabs provided good visibility and dispensed with the need for them to be turned after every trip. Ultimately, the coming of the diesels did not save the West Clare, but it did outlast the other three-foot gauge systems in Ireland, finally closing on the 31st of January, 1961. When J.H. Roberts visited the West Clare, he, like Keith Christie, began his travels at Ennis. The rail car on this occasion was hauling one of the trailers built at Inchicore and a van.
At La Hinch, the rail car is crossed by a train consisting of rail car trailers hauled by one of the diesel locomotives. At Moyasta Junction, another of the diesels is encountered, this time on freight duties. Kilkey, a popular seaside resort, was the more important of the two termini served by the railway. This was reflected in the timetables, with most trains from Ennis running through to here. After a spot of shunting, the rail car goes off to be turned on the turntable outside the old engine shed. It will be noted that only the rolling stock had been modernised. All the old infrastructure of the steam railway remained. Reunited with this trailer and van, the rail car heads off back towards the junction and ultimately on to Ennis. Horse-drawn vehicles are the only ones to be seen on the empty streets of Kilkee. These scenes and those which J. H. Roberts filmed at Kilrush enables us to put the clock back and look at another world which no longer exists. The motive power on the railway may have been modernised, but the station carter's vehicle was very traditional. These scenes at Kilrush show a slower, gentler, quieter world and perhaps make us think how much we have had to give up in return for the convenience of the motor car. And so we come to the end of our Nara Gage Odyssey with these final scenes at Kilrush. It is now over 30 years since this, the last of Ireland's three-foot gauge lines closed. But perhaps before long, a new generation will be able to enjoy the delights of the Nara Gage when the South Donegal Railway's plans to rebuild a part of the County Donegal come to fruition. I look forward to seeing you on the first train through Barnsmore Gap. <laughs>